so glad to see you all. Uh, remain standing for a couple of minutes more, as would I would ask uh, Maria to come forward and read the scripture for the day. Uh, our, our scripture for today is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. Uh, Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. So I will be reading from the New International Version. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their clocks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their clocks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Maria. Let's close our eyes for a moment in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for your word. We look up to you right now. Speak to us. May our spirits be alert and our mind receive to receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You would all agree... If I say we live in perilous days and times. And if you have been watching recent developments globally, you will see end time biblical prophecies falling in place, fulfilled at a pace like never before. Psalms 27 verse 23 reads, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And that makes you and me realize, no matter what the circumstances are, God is in total control. No fear, because he will guide us through whatever we may be facing. In the scriptures we read, we see Old Testament prophecies unfolding as Jesus walks right into each one of them walking into the city of Jerusalem, fulfilling his divine plan and purpose, the last days that he was on this earth. Quite a reminder that me and you, God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. And if only we follow that path in reverence and submission, we would see his name glorified. So I turn to the introduction of the scriptures that we just read. The road to Calvary was a difficult one. A Sunday like this, and Jesus is entering Jerusalem. He distinctly knew what lie ahead. And on his last day, last leg of his earthly journey, he was probably going through every detail that he was going to face. And as he entered Jerusalem, crowds were waving palm branches, cheering. One could sense great anticipation. And uh, if you were a visitor in that city, unfamiliar with the story of Jesus, you would probably be wondering what's happening. 
take a closer look as we some of the Old Testament prophecies unfolding in this walk of Jesus. So for the next few minutes, let us take a walk with Jesus as we enter Jerusalem. The first thing I would say is Jesus presents himself as the Messiah. Verses 23, 28 through 34 will tell you this, and that's what I'm going to be sharing on. God promised the Messiah for the Jewish people years before. They looked forward to his coming and his expectation, and their expectations were very high. Jewish history was one that there was freedom, and for another period there was captivity. And under Roman rule, the people just longed for freedom. You can imagine what you see, what you hear, the people in Palestine, Ukraine, what they're going through. For them, the only thing probably that they hoped for is peace. And the Jewish people believed the Messiah would come and set them free. Now this was, this week was very significant because it is called the Passover. Where and when they are celebrating the intervention and divine deliverance from the Egyptians, what you read in the Old Testament. The pilgrims journey to this holy city from far and wide and obviously the fervor and the zeal were at an all-time high. Part of the messianic hope was that God would send them a prophet just like Moses. And so here comes Jesus, widely known for his miracles, for his teachings, walking the road to Jerusalem with his disciples and a crowd that was following him. Obviously, there was a widespread speculation that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, remember, Jesus had revealed himself to his disciples that he is the Messiah. He was the Messiah. Now, as he prepares to enter into Jerusalem, he approaches Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, 28 through 29. As it reads, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem and as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is more than just a geographical marker having messianic implications. Ezekiel prophesies to the Jewish exiles held in captive. You will read that in Ezekiel chapter 11 and 23. The glory of the Lord went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. This was the Mount of Olives. It marked the departure of God's glory from Jerusalem because of the sin of the nation. And in Ezekiel chapter 43, verse 1, you will read that the glory of the Lord returns to Jerusalem from the east, implying that God's glory would, not yet, but would pre-enter Jerusalem from the direction, from the direction of the Mount of Olives. The Messiah, Jesus, begins entry into Jerusalem from the east. So here he is walking into Jerusalem from the east, from the Mount of Olives. And he was intentionally, deliberately, presenting himself as the Messiah. And thereby fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy. No words, just a walk. Uh, sometimes you got to see men of God, women of God just walk. If you remember, there was an old-time preacher called Shambach. Anybody heard of Shambach? He once in his message, he said, 
he used to hide behind a bush just to see his university lecturer just walk by. And he said, just to watch him walk, there was something about him with the glory of the Lord in this man. And then what happened here was that in Luke chapter 19 and verse 30, he sends for the fastened colt. And the colt was tried there, and nobody had ever ridden. If you just uh, read the scriptures, you will understand. So what does a fastened colt have to do with the Messiah? One of the earliest prophecies about Messiah comes from Jacob in the book of Genesis, chapter 49, where Jacob is an old man and he's dying, and he gathers all his sons and prophesies about each one of them and their descendants. And in particular is his prophecy about Judah. It reads like this. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 to 11. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. He will tether his donkey to a wine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash the garments in wine, his robes, the blood of grapes. For the Jewish... And for those steeped in the Old Testament, the fastened colt is just another prophecy that is being fulfilled. It's all there in the Old Testament. The donkey was never ridden, and that is significant because animals meant for sacred or royal uses were not used for regular tasks. This cult was set apart by God for a sacred and royal journey for carrying the Messiah. In verse 31 through 34, he calls himself the Lord as telling the disciples, should they ask you, who asked you to unfasten the cult? Tell them the Lord wants it. Now you see, the prophecies are gradually being unfolded. The Mount of Olives, the fast and cold. And now, for the first time, he's using or he's allowing, consenting for the disciples to let the world out there know that he is the Lord. They found the cold and as they were untying the cold, the owner asked him, why are you untying this colt? And Luke is careful to point out that the donkeys, the actual owners, are the ones who are asking the disciples. So here and now, the word Lord takes a deeper meaning. The name Lord was a title that was used for the coming Messiah, according to Psalms 110, verse 1. So let's go to the second point, which comes from verses 35 to 38. Now the people proclaim Jesus as Messiah. Now they place him on a donkey, you will find in verse 35. They brought the donkey to Jesus, threw their clocks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. Why is this important? Why is this important that they removed their clocks or whichever they had and they had to put it over the cold? Placing someone on a donkey, then following that person into town is a triumphal procession, an unmistakable sign of kingship in those days. First Kings chapter 1, 38 to 40. It reads that Solomon on King's David, uh, you will see Solomon put on King David's mule and escorted him to Gihon. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpet and all the people shouted, Long live 
King Solomon, and all the people went up after him, playing flutes and rejoicing greatly, so that the ground shook with the sound. Solomon's procession was a preview of Jesus' procession in the New Testament. It is significant that Jesus rides into the city on a donkey rather than a horse. Would it not be more uh, colorful to see Jesus riding on a donkey? Uh, sorry, on a horse? But the horse was, a, in those days, was a military animal. And when the king rode into the city on a, on a, on a horse, it signaled military victory. The donkey was used for civil ceremonies and peaceful occasions. By choosing a donkey, Jesus showed that he was coming in peace and not to overthrow the Roman Empire at that time. So they, in, uh, in verse 36, we talk about they spread their cloaks before him. Why would they do that? And other Gospels talk about the waving of the palm branches too, which is not in the Gospel of uh, Luke. The significance of uh, waving those branches is this, that there were symbols of victory. The people thinking Jesus was coming to save them from the Roman regime. That's why they decided to wave this branch and receive him as royalty, as king. They were under the impression that he's just going to come into the city and grab the power from the Roman Empire and set the people free. Why? That's what they were longing for. Now, spreading of the clocks were a sign of respect and submission to the king. In 2 Kings chapter 9 and 13, verse 13, you will read, When Elijah the prophet anointed Jehu as king, the people took their clocks and spread them under him. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. And here they are. Here they are doing the same thing. Putting the clocks on the colt, having Jesus sit on it, and following him into the city. In verses 37 to through 38, you will find they shout his praises. Now, they proclaim Jesus is the Messiah by shouting his praises. And I'll read the verses. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the mount, uh, goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The people, uh, they are now rejoicing. They are happy. They are joyful to receive the Messiah, thinking that he's come to take the power over from the Roman Empire. You must have missed the word, or I did at first. The last line in verse 38 reads, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Uh, if you recall, for Christmas, when Christ was born, it was glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to all men on whom his favor rests. But here what we read is this. The people's declaration at the entry into Jerusalem says, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Friends, the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross brought peace in heaven between God and man. He was born in a manger to bring peace for all men. And he went to the cross. He died. He was buried. But he rose again. Making peace in heaven. Just so that you and me 
have eternity to look forward to. Point number three, Jesus accepts the praise of him as the Messiah. Verses 39 to 40. Now, the revealing that Jesus is the Messiah is unfolding prophecy by prophecy. And this would be one where when the people shouted praises to him, we find in, in, in verse 39, the Pharisees objects to the people's praise of Jesus. Uh, obviously, not everyone was happy about, the G, about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. You see, who are the people who are now complaining and instructing the disciples and others? So Jesus, shh, 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 shh. who are they? Pharisees. Why? They got it. They are seeing it. They see Jesus coming into the city from the east. They see him riding on a donkey as the people wave their palm branches and lay their clocks on the road before him. They heard the people praising God and proclaiming Jesus as king just as he passed by the Mount of Olives. They understood what was happening. Before their very eyes, they saw the Old Testament prophecies unfolding one at a time. And so they tell Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples, tell them to stop. But guess what Jesus says in verse 40? I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Such a clear affirmation that Jesus accepted the people's praise of him as the Messiah. The people know, they are getting to realize this is the Messiah. Jesus is publicly acknowledging that he is the Lord. He is the Messiah. It is impossible for the disciples to keep quiet. Why? The Messiah is here and now. How can they not rejoice? So here is the story unfolding in these few scriptures. And I ask myself, what has this got to do with me? And I would say the first thing would be to believe in Jesus the Messiah. You know, just before we came over here, we were sitting inside and praying. And the dear sister over here, I don't know her name, she was praying that this being a very special day, that we would have many people come in who do not know Jesus. That this would be a day when they will hear about Jesus, receive them as their Messiah. So who is this Jesus? Why does his name ring a bell in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? Why would his name ring a bell all across the globe? Why do people worship him as the Lord and King? Why did our forefathers worship him? Why did our parents worship him? Why are you and me sitting here to worship? Simple. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him that name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. On that Sunday, the people proclaimed on the streets of Jerusalem. 
What did they proclaim? Jesus is the Messiah. Today, from the pulpit of the Lighthouse Church, we proclaim, I proclaim, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And I would continue by saying, Acts chapter 16 verse 31 reads, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe on him and you will be saved. Many Palm Sundays would have probably come and gone in some of our lives. And our tomorrows, we don't know. But today is the moment. If you just realize that Jesus indeed is the Messiah, and should you want to know more, come and speak to elders. But why wait to receive him into your life? Eternal life is yours if only you simply put your faith in Jesus, confess your sins, and accept him as your savior. Let me tell you, my friends, the Bible says, taste and see the Lord is good. You must be going through a situation, you may be. Well, let me tell you something. I have tasted him and I've known him. I wouldn't be able to tell you that until I've tasted him myself. Three years back, at this ex exact time as this, I was battling my, for my life in an ICU in the Mubarak Al Kabir Hospital. It was a long and hard battle, but I tasted seeing the hand of the Lord bring me out of it. Do you know which day I was brought out of the ICU, even though I was in a vegetative state? Resurrection Sunday, 2022. So, if you're sitting here and if you do not know this Jesus whom we are talking about, I just want you to taste him. I just want you to get into a deeper relationship with him. I want you to go further just to get to know him. And one of the ways which we, the church, can help you. You've seen the number of days that we've had for fasting and prayer. These days, the church is having a time of prayer. And guess what they're teaching us about the Holy Spirit. What better opportunity... You have reduced timings from the government to come and pray. You have reduced timing from your other activities, whatever it may be, because the restaurants are closed. Come, sit with men and women of prayer, our intercessors. Experience, heal. It's been an enriching journey the past few days. I can tell you that much. Why would I say more? Our dear sister over here, she started speaking in tongues a few days back. People were just weeping and crying and experiencing the divine touch. Don't waste this opportunity. As I told you in the beginning, I started by saying this, these days are perilous days and times we're going through. Have Jesus next to you. Have him, receive him into your life. Begin a new and meaningful relationship and if you don't have one, it can begin today. But I wish and I pray and I really desire that none of you should leave this place without knowing him and experiencing him today. Number two is serve him. He is the king of the universe. He is Jesus the Messiah. Serve him. Don't just come to the church and just go back. Tim, you can come forward actually. Thank you. The reason being, he is the king of the universe. Remember, this, they spread their clocks beneath Jesus' feet as a sign of their submission. Now that is a challenge, isn't it? We find it hard to submit to authority. When there's a supervisor, oh, this fellow is eating my brains every day. Or you say, you know, uh, how can I? And you find all kinds of things just to get, you see him coming one way, probably you just want to run the other way. 
as a believer, understand this. Submission is what the disciples did. They had Jesus on top of their clothes, meaning he took, just grabbed the opportunity. They just grabbed the opportunity to, to, to worship him and be submissive to him and say, here we are, we can serve you. We can walk with you. We know or we don't or we don't see it, but yet we will walk with you. I want, I want everyone to look at that young man over there. He's got his own challenges. But I can tell you, he serves the living God. You look at him. You look at the same man. I was telling someone today, I always stand amazed at what God can do if you have a heart to serve. That young man is a typical example of what can do God to. He can have all kinds of excuses. Sit at home and say, no, God, you gave me something which I can't handle. Why would I? Why should I? How can I? 150 excuses. But the passion, the submissiveness, saying, Lord, here I am. I am here to serve you. No matter what happens, no matter what comes, no matter I do not even see my future, but here I am. Right now, this moment, today, now, I'm here for you. When Jesus returns, he won't be riding a donkey in peace. I can tell you that much. He will be riding a white horse of victory as he comes into battle to defeat the evil one. You want to stay back, relax? Be bench warmers in the church? Go ahead. Therefore shall we serve with him, uh, serve with submissiveness, surrendered to the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. Now what does that mean? Submissive to what and how can this be possible? There's a beautiful uh, illustration, Ezekiel chapter 47. And I take this in a different context. Let's say you're standing on the shore that is a sea and the angel of the Lord is going to take you to a walk, to a walk step by step first he goes angle deep you feel it ha ah, nice nice oh yes it's good it's a nice feeling then you go up goes to the knees enjoying it still the water is cool uh, it's a nice humid day and you're enjoying the weather you're in the water, feeling nice. Go deeper. Comes to your waist. The problem is now you're not actually totally in control of yourself. Are you? The water, the, the waters around you is constraining your moments. Movements. Some kind of immobility. It's because you're getting deeper. More submissive. More submissive. Lord, I want more of you. And then you submit and go deeper. And you go deeper. The water comes, let's say, to this level. There's only one problem. Anyone standing on the shore can still see your head out there in the waters. Because Shaji is still got his arrogance, his pride. Something is ticking out. But guess what? Go deeper. That would be a river that I could not cross over. It must come. I must go to the level where people don't see me anymore, but they see only the Holy Spirit working. And what happens is that when you go under the water, it can happen now that you're totally immersed you open your mouth, just English or Hindi or what else comes to your language. You want to say, praise the Lord. What happens? Something else comes out, right? A gurgle, burble. 
That's the gift of the Holy, uh, gift of tongues. Easy, right? You know, I was just saying this. You know, I don't know whether it was in a devotions pastor was saying, what's the big thing about speaking in tongues? Do you have to strive for it? Do you have to work for it? Do you, ha- do, you, do, you, do, you do all these things? No. It's all up here. But get overwhelmed by the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? That anointing can break the yoke. It can release the fear. It can give you a confidence. It can give you strength. It can give you peace. What else do you need? More. Draw, draw, deeper, submit, 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 submit. Hmm. Hallelujah. Would you like to be immersed in the authority of the word and the spirit? Stand up. You know, my friends, if you have the desire, the Lord can fill you today. And we have meetings tomorrow. It's going to be on the infilling of the Holy Spirit, right? Right? Yeah. Come. Enjoy what happened in the upper room in Acts chapter 1 and 2. Experience the divine presence. The Holy Spirit in filling. I promise you, you will never miss it. Just a note on that, I would say probably I'm in one in a million who received the experience just as in Acts chapter 2. I heard and I received it. I go to my last point with which I'll close. Proclaim the praises of, Je- of Jesus the Messiah. Why? Because he is the eternal son of God. I tell you, Jesus said, if they, that means you and me, keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Can the stones cry out? Why do you have to make these bricks cry out? When God has given you a voice, Siddhu will tell you, when I was in the hospital in 2021, I had one pipe or tube, you say, right? Going through my nose. Another one through my mouth. Another one through my throat. And I greatly decide saying, I just want to say Jesus. I couldn't. I wanted to lift one finger. You know, one finger. One finger. I couldn't. I wanted to just lift my hands and say, thank you, God. I couldn't. God was making me, teaching me to surrender to be submissive. The healing came in good time. Why? Because I did receive him into my life. He is my God. Remember the song which we sang, Jehovah Jireh? So the keyboard plays something, please. So I did. But I don't want to be in that state. And I pray that none of you will be in that state. So, my point is this. When you have the breath of God in your life, say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah. What can stop you? What can stop you from raising your hands? Do you know why I raise my hands? Do you know what it feels like to raise hands and praise God? You got to be in my position. Then you will realize. You want to say out loud, thank you, Jesus, praise the Lord, glory. Lord, I glorify you, I give you all the praise, I give you all the honor. You want to see? Don't let God take you to that valley. He has given you strength in your hands. You are here because He has sustained you. He is your provider. He is your Jehovah Jireh. And you are here. And if you cannot raise your hands, God will make this bricks shout. Dignified in worship? (laughs) David, his wife. Uh, By the way, he was not even a leader. He was a, David, was a king. And he started dancing in the presence of God. 
And his wife said, look at this fellow. It's not you or your father who has put me in this place. It is God Almighty. And I don't care what you say. I don't care what she says. I don't care what these people say. I don't care what anyone says. As long as I have breath in me, I will praise the Lord. This person sitting next to you will not be there in your time of need. But Jesus will be there. 